thank you, Catherine, for accepting to give a talk in our seminar. So today we have Catherine Hess, who all of you know, and she will speak about commonalic machine, a commonalic machine for creating calculi. All yours. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. I would have been great to actually be in Barcelona today, but uh, as we were discussing earlier, it's actually a little bit, of course, logistically easier. But yeah, it is a shame not to actually be together with all of you. It's nice to see so many uh, friendly, familiar faces. And uh, yeah, so thanks for coming by, and I hope you'll enjoy the talk. So what I'm going to be talking about today is a project that uh, Brenda Johnson and I have been working on for a very long time. And since we're both very busy people, it doesn't advance as quickly as it might. But I think we've come to we've reached a point now where I'm. I think that it's uh, it's reached a nice form. So. It's not really higher structures. I mean, there's some weak equivalences, there's some model categories, some push model categories that will show up. I think probably the right way to do what I'm gonna talk about today would be to do it in terms of infinity categories. And if somebody wants to take the ball and run with it and do it the right way in the infinity categories, that'd be great. I'd be really happy about that. But so what I'm gonna tell you about today is sort of more like a, a one categorical with a bit of homotopy theory mixed in approach to thinking about what a calculus is and how one could create like a whole family of calculus. So indeed the first part of the talk is to be like, what is a calculus? I mean, what is a possible definition of what we mean by a calculus? And then how we can go from commonads to calculi. Like how can we get, it's gonna be something like a tower of commonads is gonna give us a calculus and how does this happen? And, and what is the, what's the trick behind that? And then we're gonna see how we can, you know, if commonads give us calculus, then what gives us commonads? Well, we'll see a good way to create commonads of the sort that we want is to start with modules over PN, where PN is the post set of subsets of the numbers from one to N. I'm thinking about modules over such things actually give rise to commonads of a sort that are useful in the context of calculate. And then we're going to specialize to saying, well, how does this give us a machine for producing calculi on functor categories? And so that's the, the plan for what we're going to go, go through today. So let's start with what I think a calculus is in a very broad sense of the term or category theoretic sense of the term anyway. So here's a kind of informal definition. We're going to suppose that we have some category M equipped with weak equivalences. And this category M is not necessarily a model category. I mean, sometimes it'll need to be, sometimes it'll need to be something like a simplicial model category. But for the time being, let's take a category M equipped with some distinguished family of weak equivalences. And what do I want when I, when I have a calculus? I want to say if I start with some object in my category M, then a calculus should spit out a sequence of approximations to X that are related to each other in some way and where I need to have some way of comparing X to each of these. So I have some morphisms that are connecting X to each of these successive approximations. And what I'm thinking of is that this morphism from X to XN should be increasingly close to being a weak equivalence as N goes to infinity. So the idea is that we're thinking about this morphism from X to XN as some sort of degree and approximation of the object X. And so if we're thinking about, you know, old fashioned calculus that we all learned when we were in kindergarten, we're thinking there about these, this would be sort of like a Taylor approximation, the nth Taylor polynomial, there would be some sort of approximation to a function or something like this. And it's getting to be, it's closer and closer to being actually um, an equivalence to what you started with. So that's the, the basic picture of the kind of thing we're looking for in a calculus, a way of taking an object in M and spitting out naturally a sequence of approximations, increasingly good approximations to whatever object we start with. So let's try to make this a little more formal. And so the framework in which we can work is what they call co-augmented towers. So now suppose you should have some category A and starting from the category A, I'm going to define a category that I'm going to denote like this with a little eta here to denote co-augmented, co-augmented towers in the category A. And all this is, is towers in A, so sequences of, of morphisms in A, together with morphisms out of a fixed object into each of these and all of these triangles Q. Just a co-augmented tower. Now, the reason that I wrote my tower lying down is because my blackboard is horizontal and not vertical. And so it's, it would take up too much room to write it. Uh, vertically, so it's a, a tower that has crashed, I suppose. But in any case, here's this, this co-augmented tower 
in this category. And obviously the morphisms are what they have to be in this context. So this is the right kind of object into which we want, we want to sort of thinking about calculus, we're gonna take an object in my original category and spit out some sort of co-augmented tower like this. So now, what is, that, what is that really saying? So suppose now that we have some subcategory B of my category A. And the kind of thing a calculus does is to take an object in B and spit out a co-augmented tower in A. That is to say, we start with some object, little b in B, and it's gonna give me some tower of objects in A. So these sort of these, think of these as kind of successive approximations to B that look like this. So the gamma ends like this. And they're all going to be co-augmented under B itself. So we'll have all these morphisms connecting little b to these various approximations if we want to think of it that way. So we'll call this sort of functor from a subcategory of A into the category of co-augmented towers in A, we'll call this a tower functor. So a calculus is going to be a special kind of tower functor that's associating to an object a sequence of what should be approximations to that object. Excuse me, can yeah. I, if I can ask a question. What is yeah. the exponent tau? Uh, your, your annotation is tau. Way, but is, this, is this an oh, N? Yeah. Or it's not an N. Your, your towers are infinite, right? Yeah, my towers are infinite. Okay, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. That's eta. Eta is. Eta. Why eta? Me here? Yeah, no, no, the exponent. Oh, okay. Okay. Because, because uh, these are not just towers, they're all co augmented, right? Okay. Because, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you very You're much. Welcome. That's why there's Sorry. the eta. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? And please do stop me, please ask questions. It's, it's so much nicer. I gave a 35 minute talk to a group of people this morning and nobody said anything for the whole time. It was really, oh, yeah. anyway. Um, so this is the kind of thing we want to have when we're, we want to construct when we're constructing a calculus. Okay, so now that we have the right sort of language or a useful language for talking about calculi, let's go back to thinking about calculi themselves. So, what are we going to calculus again? We start with the category, there's some notion of weak equivalences, and I'm going to suppose I have some subcategory of M. And what I'm going to call a calculus on M prime with values in M is going to be a tower functor. So it's going to associate to an object in M prime one of these augmented tower, co augmented towers in M, such that, well, there are going to be a few conditions that should be satisfied. The first one says the following. Okay, now remember that. If I have an object X in M prime, then the fact that I have this tower functor here means that for every N, I have a morphism from X to what should be some sort of nth approximation to X. We call this A to N of X. And I can apply gamma M, which gives me the nth approximation to this morphism. And so that gives me a morphism from gamma m of x to gamma m of gamma n of x. And I say that this should be a weak equivalence whenever m is less than or equal to n. How should we think of this? Well, gamma n of x is supposed to be some sort of degree n approximation. And then I'd be taking the degree m approximation of the degree n approximation. And I'm saying that should be the same thing as the degree m approximation, as long as m is less than or equal to n, which makes sense. So the degree m, degree m approximation is equivalent to the degree of approximation of the degree n approximation, as long as this condition is satisfied. Seems reasonable. At least we you know, they keep this motivation of thinking about Taylor polynomials in mind. What if we have the other situation now m is greater than or equal to n? So I say that this morphism should also be a weak equivalence. What are we thinking about here? So I'm looking at, I'm now taking gamma n of x and I'm feeding it into this functor here. And I look at the nth approximation of gamma n of x. What I'm saying is if I take the nth approximation of the nth approximation when m is greater than or equal to n, well, then I haven't changed anything. If I already have a, a polynomial that's of a degree at most n, and I take a degree at most m approximation of that where m is greater than or equal to n, it shouldn't change anything. So the degree n approximation is equivalent to its own degree m approximation when m is greater than or equal to n. Again, something that seems quite reasonable. Finally, because we're doing homotopy theory, we have one more condition which says that if I start with a morphism here that is a weak equivalence, then its image under each of the gamma n's should also be a weak equivalence. So we need to want to preserve that. So we have this sort of homotopy invariance. 
And that's all we're going to say a calculus is. We're going to have those very reasonable sounding sorts of conditions, at least when you're a homotopy theorist. OK. So then we can say, well, what does it mean to be a better and better approximation? Well, now we're supposed that we have enough structure on our category M that we actually have some notion of what it means to take a homotopy limit. So we should be saying, well, we have a simplicial model category or something like that. So suppose we have a calculus like this. So satisfying those three conditions I just stated. Then if I have an object in the category M prime, I'll say that the tower gamma of X converges to X if the induced map from X into the homotopy limit of the tower is actually weak equivalence. So that's what it would mean for really our approximation to be getting better and better. Again, this is all very, you know, there's nothing very uh, concrete about this yet. It's sort of what you might, what you would like to have as a framework, as a general framework. Now, when, it, when you think about the original motivations of the homotopy calculus of Goodwillie and so on, people are interested in developing calculi on functor categories, where my M would actually be a category of functors from some category, probably into a model category or something like that. So let's see what happens when we specialize to that case. So here's the special case we're interested in. Suppose now that we have our category M that has some weak equivalences and the category C that also has some weak equivalences. And we say, well, maybe we want to focus on some particular subcategory of functors from C to M. Maybe we want functors that, have, that satisfy some special additional property, whatever is interesting for your context. And then suppose we have a calculus that on this category, taking values in this one, and we'll say it's a homotopy calculus, if for every functor here, if that functor preserves weak equivalences, then its image under each of the gamma ends also preserves weak equivalences. So it takes homotopy functors to homotopy functors. So this is the sort of situation in which the original Goodwillie calculus is formulated and so on. And well, this is the, the special case towards which we will be building the, the functor calculus, the calculus that I will be describing as we go along. Okay, so indeed, to, the point of today's talk is to describe a functorial pipeline for creating such calculi on functor categories. So you'll be able to take some specific kind of input and say, with this kind of input, I know how to create a new calculus. And it also can make, gives you a way of comparing such calculi because everything is very functorial. And I say, well, if I have two different inputs that are connected by some morphism, that gives me some sort of natural transformation between the calculi. It's a, it's a framework in which should make it easier to compare different calculi. So let's look, before we're going into how we can actually build some things, let's see what kind of properties just sort of come for free in this abstract context. So suppose we have a calculus like this. So a calculus on some subcategory M prime taking values in co-augmented towers in M. All right, now sometimes you want your calculus to have some sort of nice property. For example, suppose this is actually a model category and maybe you'd like your calculus to take its values in fibrant objects in your model category. Suppose you have some sort of functorial fibrant replacement functor you can do. So you have something like this, some sort of natural transformation of the identity to some sort of functor that maybe is some sort of functorial fibrant replacement. Then there's a way to build a calculus out of the original calculus gamma and this natural transformation that will actually give you values that you want. So some sort of whiskering process that you can do where you can start with your object X and you can take the original tower you had with the gamma N of X, you apply this functor R to it, and then you have a comparison that you get as well by using your original eta. So eta N minus one of X, for example, is gonna take you from X into gamma N minus one of X. And then this natural transformation will take you further to the composite of the two. And so now this gives you a calculus taking values, for example, in vibrant objects, if that's what your functor R does. So that's a, a nice way to sort of, uh, to make your calculus even a little bit nicer if you want to. There's also a natural notion of what it means for something to be of degree less than or equal to N where you could say that an object in M prime is of degree less than or equal to N if this comparison map to the nth layer to the, sorry, of the tower is actually a weak equivalence. 
Now, is this a reasonable definition of what it means for something to be of degree less than or equal to n? Does it fit with what we think of as being a polynomial of degree less than or equal to n? Well, let's see. It turns out that if you have, if m is greater than or equal to n, and x is of degree less than or equal to n, so this thing is a weak equivalence, then x is also of degree less than or equal to n. That's, you know, it's really what you would like. Um, you wouldn't want it be true, to be true that if m were greater than or equal to n and x is of degree less than or equal to n, then it's not of degree less than or equal to n. So it's good that that works. Now, suppose we add one more condition. Suppose we say that the category we're working in is actually pointed. Then we have a notion of what it means to be a function that's homogeneous of degree n, so like a polynomial that's homogeneous of degree n. So that it li lives basically only in, in gamma n, only that approximation is non-trivial. So we'll say it's homogeneous of degree n if it's of degree less than or equal to n. So x is equivalent to gamma n of x and gamma n minus one of x is trivial. So do such things exist? Where do we find such things? Well, if, now let's add one more condition that we have some sort of functorial homotopy fiber construction. So now we can suppose we're, for example, in a simplicial model category. So we have some sort of functorial homotopy fiber construction. Then there's a functor that gives you sort of the nth layer of your tower. So it's telling you what are you adding into this tower, what it makes the difference between gamma n and gamma n minus one. So this we'll call this lambda n that takes an object x to the homotopy fiber of the map from gamma n of x to gamma n minus one of x. So it's just the, the difference between the degree n minus one approximation and the degree n approximation. So this would be like the n sum end of your Taylor polynomial. And where well, you could hope that this would actually give you something that really was homogeneous. And indeed, under at least some reasonable conditions under gamma, which I'm not going to state specifically here, this thing is homogeneous. And if you take the, you look at the map a to n of x, which is your map from x to gamma n of x, so it's this comparison map from x to gamma n of x, and you apply this nth layer functor to that, that actually is an equivalence. So the nth layer of x itself is equal to or equivalent to the nth layer of its degree n approximation. So it, things work again the way you would hope they would, at least under some reasonable conditions on gamma. So this is all uh, the sorts of phenomena that have been observed in very specific calculi and that work in, a, in this very general framework. So one example of a calculus that just sort of dropping from the sky, but is very sort of intuitive and gives you an idea of what the what kind of situation we're looking for. So suppose we're in the category of unbounded chain complexes over some commutative ring R, equipped with the usual projective model structure. So there is a calculus on this category. So it's on the category itself. You don't need to restrict to a subcategory, where the nth layer, uh, the nth uh, stage of the tower, gamma n of x is a chain complex is defined by taking a certain quotient of x itself. So up through degree k, it's just x itself, sorry, up to degree n, it's just x itself. And then in degree n plus one, you quotient by the kernel of the n plus first point, uh, boundary. And then you look at the induced differential. And in this case, you get a nice chain complex and the tower, that you get to so the comparison maps from X to this complex and between the um, different layers, sorry, different stages of the tower are just quotient maps. It's very, very straightforward in this context. So what is this calculus actually doing for you? You can check easily that all of the conditions hold. It really is a calculus. And in this case, what you're seeing is that if you look at the homology of this nth stage in the tower, it's the same as the homology of X up through dimension N and it's zero above that. So it, this is, again, a very easy sort of thing to build. It's just sort of give you some intuition for what a calculus, a very simple calculus can look like. And in this case, you can actually build this, these layers with no problem. It's the homotopy fiber of this comparison map. And this is the explicit computation. But the point is that in that case, the homology of the nth layer is just, it's the homology of x when k equals n and zero otherwise. So it's just picking out the nth layer of the homology. So it's really sort of fits with our idea of what it means to be degree n or homogeneous of degree n. 
Okay. Any questions on that before I go to the next section? If not, then I'm going to explain how from comonads on the simplicial model category, you can get calculi. So first I'm going to recall what a comonad is just to make sure we're all on the same page. So now we'll just go back to some category A and see what a comonad is. Well, the short way of saying it is that the comonoid in the category of endofunctors of A with monoidal structure given by composition. More explicitly, this means that we have an endofunctor K on A. We have two natural transformations, delta, which is uh, co-multiplication, epsilon, which you can think of as a co-unit, that satisfy various naturality properties, that there's a co-associativity here and a co-unitality. Okay, so that's all it means for something to be a co-monad. You can talk about morphisms between comonads. So suppose I have two of them. Usually when I'm writing a comonad, I'm going to use the, the bold face symbol because it's gonna be important to also to keep track of what the co-multiplication and the co-unit are. And so a comonad morphism from a comonad K to a comonad K prime is just some natural transformation between the underlying endofunctors satisfying two natural conditions, one having to do with respecting the co-unit. And this is the condition one would usually apply for showing that it's, um, that the compatibility between the two co-multiplications, okay? And so this gives us a category of comonoids on the category A. So there's also a notion more generally of a category of comonads, um, and which we'll mention briefly in a little while, but this is, most of the time we can focus on comonads on a fixed category. Now, a great source of comonads, it comes from adjunctions. So suppose I have an adjunction like this, left adjoint L, right adjoint R, with a unit from the identity on B to RL, and a co-unit from LR to the identity on A. Then this information together gives rise to a comonad on the category A, where the endofunctor on A is the composite LR, the co-multiplication is L A to R, and we just use the co-unit itself as the co-unit of the comonad. All right, and you can even be uh, fancier and say, if I have a comonad that acts on B, then I can get a comonad on A by doing R, whatever comonad is on B, and then coming back by L. And we're gonna do something like that in a little while as well. But this is sort of a very nice source of lots of comonads. Now, once we have a comonad, there's a certain simplicial construction associated to it that is really important for us. Oh, for, wait, sorry. First, I need to talk about coalgebra. Sorry. So, suppose I have a comonad on category A. Then, what I mean by a coalgebra, some people might say a comodule on this comonad, is an object in the category A equipped with a sort of a co multiplication or co action of the comonad on C. That looks like this. This is a morphism in A, satisfying a sort of co-associativity property once again, and a co-unitality property like this. And this gives rise to a category of K coalgebras. All right. So now for the simplicial construction I wanted to talk about. So suppose we have a comonad like this, endofunctor and two natural transformations then we can associate to this comonad a functor that takes an object of A to a simplicial object in A, the nth level of which is given by iterating the endofunctor K n plus one times on the object A. So I can do another object in A. And where is the simplicial structure coming from? Well, here's level zero, one, and two in my simplicial object. So the zero degeneracy here is just given by the natural transformation delta. And the faces are given by the natural transformation epsilon, either applied to Ka or K applied to epsilon A. And similarly, we go up, we're going to have code, we're going to have degeneracies given by delta and various composites of K. And the face maps that are given by epsilon composed in various ways are whiskered in various ways with K. And so on. So this gives us a nice simplicial object in A. It's even an augmented simplicial object because we can use the natural transformation epsilon to go from Ka to A. So we have this very nice 
augmented simplicial object. Now, if our, our object A is actually equipped with a K coalgebra structure, then this is even a simplicial object that emits extra degeneracies because we can use this coaction or co-multiplication map delta to give us the extra degeneracy we'd like to have in this simplicial construction. Uh, I, have a, I have a question, if I may. Sure. Uh, why don't you call that a co-bar construction? Because you, you, you eat a co-guy. I do, you... well, it, in, because it's something simplicial. Um, that's why. Okay. I think of the co-bar construction as being co-simplicial. Oh. But I agree that these things are tricky. <laughs> it depends on how you're exactly what perspective you're taking on it. It seems more natural in this context. Think of it as a bar construction because it's simplicial. Okay, good. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so there's our bar construction. Now, of course, when you say bar construction, you see a simplicial object, and what you want to do is geometrically realize, but then you need to be in a uh, have a little more structure on your category. So. But one comment before we talk about that, we can move a little bit further. So this is this whole construction is actually natural, not just in A, but also in K, with respect to this notion of morphism of co-monads that I was talking about. So we actually get from a pair of a co-monad and an object in A, we can get a morphism of these simplicial constructions. So this naturality is not hard to prove, but it's, it's useful to keep in mind. So what does this have to do with calculus? All right, now suppose we have not just a category, but we have a nice pointed simplicial model category. Now this is, a, this is one of these first situations where you could probably, you could certainly do this in some other context. I choose one particular context in which it works so that I have specific constructions in mind, but I am not saying that this is the only way to apply this machine. Okay, so we have a functor. This is going to be gamma. You see a sort of hint of calculus since I'm using gamma here, right? That it's going to take a co-monad on the category M and an object in M and spit out another object in M in the following way. I take this simplicial bar construction here. I take its geometric realization, which I know how to do because I'm in a simplicial model category. And I have a map from this geometric realization to X itself. It's coming from this uh, augmentation of the simplicial construction. And I'm going to take the homotopy cofiber of this. Now, one thing to point out is that this epsilon is going to be a weak equivalence if X admits a K coalgebra structure, because then we have our extra degeneracies in the construction and everything is going to collapse. So what this is measuring is, in some sense, how far X is from admitting a K coalgebra structure. That's what this thing is measuring here. So, and one final point is, well, if I wanted to have, I mean, I'm trying to construct a calculus, which means I want to have one of these tower functors. So it has to associate to an element, an object in M, a co-augmented tower. So I need a bunch of gammas, but I also need comparison maps. And my comparison map is coming from the fact that since this guy is the co homotopy co-fiber of this map, there's like a natural map from X into gamma K of X. Okay, so we have the, the comparison map that we want is coming to us for free in this way. Now, again, here I'm going to put in a little bit of technical stuff that I'm sure, again, one could probably find another way to do if one changed specific contexts out of moving, out of working with pointed simplicial model categories. So I'm going to call a commonad compliant if it behaves nicely. Behaving nicely means that I want the bar construction to take values in really cofibrant objects, so some technical model category type condition. This is in um, many contexts a perfectly reasonable thing to ask for. I want my functor k, the underlying endofunctor, to preserve weak equivalences. Again, there are plenty of examples in which this is not a problem. And then here's sort of another little uh, technical condition, which again, for the examples that I've thought about actually poses no problem. In fact, this is usually, in the, for the functors k I've been thinking about, usually even an isomorphism. But we want it at least to be a weak equivalence that we can commute co-limits over delta up with k. Anyway, just the technical conditions, we have plenty of examples that satisfy them. Okay, so we're going to see now that towers of co-monads are gonna give us tower functors. So here's the point. Suppose we're working with one of these nice pointed simplicial model categories. 
turns out that there's a bifunctor from the category of towers, not necessarily co-augmented, just towers of co-monads. So I have just a, a sequence of morphisms of co-monads across M to co-augmented towers on M. So this is going to give us tower functors. So the point is that here, if I take some tower of co-monads, so it looks like this, I have some sequence of co-monads with co-monad morphisms connecting them. Then for every object X in M, I'm going to get a co-augmented tower in M in the following way. Well, I can use these homotopy cofiber constructions I was just talking about, these gammas associated to each of the co-monads, taking the homotopy cofiber of the, out of the geometric realization of the bar construction into X. And I can do that for each of these gammas. And then because all of these constructions are natural as well in the comonet variable, we also get a natural comparison between these guys coming from here. And we have these eta maps, these natural comparison maps that I talked about in the previous slide from the original, from the object X to each of these approximations. And this is giving us one of these augmented towers, co-augmented towers, sorry. Okay, and it's natural in X and in K, and in the tower K. Now, when does this actually give us a calculus? Well, suppose that I have, again, same context as before, I'm gonna fix some subcategory of M, and I have some tower of commonads again, and I suppose they are compliant. So this technical stuff I talked about a couple of slides back. Under those conditions, this is actually a calculus. So that the tower we had on the previous page is really going to give us calculus in the sense that I defined it in, pre, in the previous section. So we really can get a, a calculus from a tower of at least nice enough comonants. What about this business of homogeneity? So when we have some object that is actually so strictly of degree n, well, to talk about homogeneity, we need to actually be thinking about, at least in the con specific context I've been working in, we need to add an additional condition of stability to our model category. So we can be thinking about uh, some model for spectra, for example, and all objects are vibrant, so a particularly nice model spectra. And we have to have some, <clears throat> sorry, nice relationship between the endofunctors Kn and the uh, homotopy fiber, then it turns out this thing is actually n homogeneous that the nth layer is unhomogeneous. So here's an example. Let's get our hands dirty and see what goes on. And there's something that's different from, um, I believe, other calculus, calculi that have been considered in the past. So let's again consider the category of simplicial abelian groups with this usual simplicial model structure. And I'm gonna fix some family of primes, okay? Indexed over the natural numbers. And I'm going to, derived from that family of primes, a sequence of rings, sequence of localizations of, of uh, the integers and various of these primes. So for K between one and N for Rn. So the unit map from the integers into Rn induces an adjunction between the category M of simplicial abelian groups and the category of simplicial Rn modules, where this is just forgetting along I n, yoda N and this is harming out of Rn. Now, because we have an adjunction like this, we know we get an induced comonad on Rn by doing harm followed by pulling back. And so we're gonna get for each N, a comonad on M. So here we have our comonad again, and the inclusion of Rn into Rn plus one then induces in fact, a comonad morphism from the n plus first comonad to the n flips it around like this. So this is actually going to give us a tower of comonads like this, associated to this particular choice, this particular sequence of primes. We get this tower of comonads on m. Now this is the, what, the kind of input we need for our machine for creating calculi on the category m. Now let's consider the following subcategory M prime of M, which is all those simplicial abelian groups such that each layer, each of the, each level of the simplicial abelian group is actually torsion free. So this is a, this is a case where it's really nice to be able to make this restriction in order for things to work. So we're to restrict to a subcategory. So it turns out that this 
power function that we get by using this particular tower of co-monads and restricting to this subcategory actually gives us a calculus on the category of torsion-free simplicial abelian groups with values in simplicial abelian groups. And what is this really detecting? What is this calculus actually doing? So I think of this as sort of some sort of divisibility calculus in some sense. And the nth layer here is sort of is detecting that part of the simplicial abelian group that is pn divisible, but not pk divisible for k less than n. So it's, a, it's picking up subtle notions of divisibility in this context. So it's kind of fun to play with and see what other kind of examples you can come up with of how you can create these kinds of powers of commonads to pick out interesting structure like this. So to summarize what we've seen in this section before we dive into how now we can get commonads. So in the context where we have a pointed simplicial model category and we have some subcategory of that pointed simplicial model category, we have a bifunctor that associates to a tower of commonads and an object in M, a calculus, like a sequence of approximations of that element. So we have a way of producing these tower functors and as long as our input is a tower of these compliant comonads, and certainly more generally as well, but that's where we know how to prove it, that this is actually going to give you a calculus. So we are motivated to try to figure out how we can come up with towers of compliant comonads. Or at least how, let's start with just how we can get towers of comonads and then worry about the compliance afterwards. Any questions before we move on? All right, if not, I'm going to show you how you can get comonads and towers of comonads out of modules over the post set of subsets of numbers from one to n. So this my notation of pn, as I said, is the post set of subsets of one to n. I'm going to equip with a strict monoidal structure, in this case, given by union. Now here is where things could go two ways. We could bifurcate here and work with a strict monoidal structure that's given by intersection instead. And we will end up with a completely dual theory, which would lead not to the creation of comonads, but the creation of monads, and not to the creation of towers, but to the creation of, well, I suppose, telescopes. So there's a whole dual theory that would, if just by the making the innocent change of union for intersection, would lead to a theory of co-calculus rather than a theory of calculus. But I'm going to stick with the, with the union and talk about calculus. So just to draw pictures so we get the right idea in our heads of what Pn looks like when n equals the one, we just have this, of course. When n equals two, we have a square. When n equals three, we have a cube and so on. So in other words, if I'm thinking about a functor from Pn into a category A, it's giving me n cubical diagrams in the category A. All right. Now, what is a PN module? Well, I'm thinking about PN is this monoidal category, strict monoidal category. Well, it's going to be a category D equipped with an action of PN. So that's going to be some bifunctor from D cross PN to D. That is an action in the sense that if I apply the unit in PN, it's just the identity on D, and that I have this sort of usual action condition, sort of associativity condition. And that's going to give me a category of PN modules. And magically, we're going to get from PN modules to comonads. Well, what does it actually mean to have a PN module structure? I think it's helpful to have a few different ways of thinking about it. So it turns out that there are a number of equivalent ways of thinking about this. So having a PN module structure on a category D is the same as having a family of N strictly idempotent monads on, on D that commute. And I'll explain why in a moment. Another way to say the same thing is that it's equivalent to having a family of N different localizations of the category D that also commute. If I do the jth localization followed by the i, the same as doing the ith localization followed by the jth. Now this is all very strict. And this is where you start to say, mm, maybe I should be working in a world where I don't have to worry about things being on the nose and such. But this is why I think it could be really interesting to push this actually into the infinity category world. 
In any case, this is what a PN model structure is. And I think it's really, it's, it's useful to have these alternate ways of, of seeing what it means. So why are these equivalent? Now here's, the, here's the idea. It's really very straightforward. Having an action map theta from D cross PN to D is the same as having, using transposition, a functor from PN into the category of endofunctors on D. That is to say, you're getting an N cubical diagram of endofunctors on D. Now, what do you know about these endofunctors? Well, first of all, the condition that applying the unit just gives you identity is saying that the image of the unit, the empty set, is just the identity on D. So in your N cubical diagram of endofunctors, the upper left-hand corner is always going to be the identity on D. And then this condition, this sort of action condition, which says that if you apply S and then T, it's the same as applying S union T, which is the same as applying T and then S because this guy is um, symmetric. Then if you look at how that translates, it's saying that if I look at the image under this theta sharp of S and T, then the composite in one sense has to be equal to the composite in the other sense. And that's where the strict commutativity of these different idempotent functors is coming from. So I find it illuminating when I saw that there was this other interesting way of thinking about these PN module maps. Okay. So an example of such a thing, an example in quotation marks here, because things actually here, I, I should, uh, I couldn't actually write equals, there would have to be isomorphisms everywhere. So it's, one would have to loosen things up a little bit here, but um, one could, well, by putting in all the appropriate coherences. Anyway, suppose I have a commutative ring R and I have some collection of subsets of R. And then we think about the various localizations of R with, at, at these subsets. So the functor theta S, so this PN action on the category of R modules is gonna take an R module M and a subset of the numbers from one to N to the R module is given by tensoring M with its localization of these guys. Okay, and so this is actually giving me a family of localizations like this, which satisfies what I want, not on the nose, but up to natural isomorphisms. Whence example in quotation marks. Okay, so how do I get from these notions of uh, PN modules to comonads? So again, now I'm gonna be back in the world of simplicial model categories. And then we talk about what it means to take the iterated fiber first of a square, so a functor from P2 into M, and then more generally for an N cubical diagram in N. So here we have a square diagram in N like this, and the iterated fiber says, I take the fibers vertically, and then I take the fiber horizontally, and this is the iterated fiber. Of course, I could also have started by taking horizontally and then taken vertically up to weak equivalence, it would be the same thing. And so this is called the iterated fiber of the square. Now there's another good way to think about this iterated fiber, which is to say, instead, I could look at it as the homotopy limit of the following diagram, where I sort of take this square and I complete it to something bigger by putting the base point everywhere else and taking the homotopy limit and it's perfectly equivalent. So this is some, in fact, some sort of left con extension that we're doing here before we do this homotopy limit. And that using that language enables us to see, provide a, a general description of how we do this in higher levels. So in higher levels, we could again take an n-cubical diagram and then take its homotopy limit by, you know, extend it with lots of base points all over the place and take the homotopy limit. And the way we make that explicit is by taking a certain left con extension. So there's some category, we call it V, that is basically like the, the interval where you've added on an extra bit here. And you can take the category Pn and map it into the product of V with itself n times in a certain way. And if you do the left con extension of your n cube along this, and take the homotopy limit of that, that's a nice description of this iterated fiber. But the basic idea is just as you're taking your n cube, putting a bunch of base points and maps from base points in all the right places and taking a homotopy limit. Okay, so how are these iterated fibers going to help us move towards comonads? So, well, we need to figure out which n cubes we want to study. So again, we have our pointed simplicial model category. We have some PN module. So we have some action of PN on some category D. 
And we have some functor from D into my category M. And how am I going to build an N cube from that? Well, we're going to work as follows. I'm going to define an N cube in the category M by saying it takes a subset of the numbers from one to N to what I would get by taking theta, I apply it to D and to T, that gives me a new object in D. And then I can apply F to that, it gives me an object in M. So I have something like this. I'm going to go, I have D, I have a fixed D like this. So I go D cross PN into D, theta F M. So it's this composite here that we're using in order to define in order to define this guy here. So this is the way we can build very specific n cubes in the category M from this action and from any functor like this. Okay. So here's an example when n equals two. So when n equals two, we can have here, here's our action, which I'll write just like this, S acting on D and I apply F. And so the Two cube you would get in that case is f applied to this, f applied to this, this, and so on. So this is the sort of thing we get for our n cubes. So how do PN modules induce co-monads? Well, suppose again, we're in a situation where we have a pointed simplicial model category. Then there's a functor that associates to any PN module a co-monad. And here you notice I didn't put anything here. It's the, the uh, category in which the co-monad acts varies a bit, and I'll explain what that category is. So for a fixed D theta, so for a fixed category with an action of PN, we have a co-monad on the category functors from D to my category M. And I need to say what the underlying endo functor is. So this endo functor is an endo functor on the category of functors from D into M. And how does it act? Well, it takes a functor from D to M and when I apply it to an object, little d, it does the following. It's going to calculate just the iterated fiber of this cube that I was just talking about, which is going to give me an element in M. Okay, so I feed F into this. This endo functor gives me a new functor from D to M. I apply D to it. How is it computed? I take the iterated fiber of this N cube I just defined. Now, because we actually, want to be able to define a, a functor calculus on the category, uh, sorry, a calculus on the category from just from just some arbitrary category C into my category M. The way I'm going to do that is by doing comparisons between C and various DN modules. So a comparison between C and DN modules, some sort of functor from C into a D where D is equipped with a PN module structure. And so the objects of this sort where I have a PN module and I have a comparison functor like this, I'm going to look at a sort of PN modules under C. And then the morphisms in this category, well, if I have a couple of these guys, it's not just the existence of a functor here, but there has to be some sort of natural transformation. And there's some sort of compatibility between the different actions and this functor G. Let's not worry too much about the details. What's important is the objects that we're looking at. So PN modules together with some sort of comparison map. And there's a relative version of the first result I just gave you about going from PN modules to co-monads that says that if I fix a small category, and if I fix a point in simplicial model category M, I can associate to one of these PN modules under C, a co-monad specifically on the category of functors from C to M. So again, this is like, this is the, what we wanted to do, have a co-monads on functors from C to M, because then that's a way to get, to start building towers and eventually calculate. So what is the endo functor in this case? Well, we have this piece in the middle that we just defined, which is a way of associating to any PN module, a functor from the, uh, an endo functor on this category functors here. And we can use the right and left con extensions of T to in the end get us a functor from an endo functor on the category functors from C to M. Okay, so it's this built from the absolute case, we can get this relative case. And here we're using this, this thing where we have a co-monad on this category and we have an adjunction between this functor category and this functor category where the right and left adjoints are this functor 
and this functor. So this is using this way of creating new commonads from old using injunctions. So now, okay, now we, we just saw how we could get common ads on functor categories, the functors from C to M. But what I really want, if I want to get calculi, are towers of common ads. So how can I get towers of common ads? Why you get towers of these relative modules? So I'm going to end very here. So I'm going to end very. And for various n, I'm going to suppose I have here's a PN module. Here's a comparison map from C to this PN module. So this is this part is a relative PN module. And then we have ways of gluing together the different layers in the tower that I'm not going to specify too closely. So there we have a PN module, there we have a functor, and then we have some morphism in this category of PN modules under C. So those are the objects that we're thinking about. And here we're just using the fact that we can include the post set of subsets of one to n in, in the post set of subsets of one to n plus one to use some sort of pullback. And so this actually gives us a category, you don't want to think about what the morphisms are, of towers under C, where here we're with P star because the N is varying. And it turns out that what we already did for this relative case here generalizes to thinking about these towers. So we get a morphism out of indeed the opposite category of the category of towers into the tower of comonads on this functor category from C into M. So once we have a functor category, uh, a way of getting from towers, a way of producing towers of commonads, we say, aha, now we know we how to produce towers that could lead eventually to calculi, what we saw before. So here's the pipeline. So here, if I have a small category C and a point in simplicial model category M, and I'm interested in producing some sort of calculus on the functors category from C to M. If I have one of these towers of modules under C, like this, I have this functor that I just defined that produces from such a tower here, a tower of comonads. And what we saw in the previous section was a way of associating to a tower of comonads and, and um, object in the model category, one of these co-augmented towers. So that this is a way of producing a tower functor like this. So this composite is actually our pipeline for going from towers of PN modules where N is varying to co-augmented towers of functors and natural transformations. So how does in the end, does this give us a real machine producing calculi? We're almost there. So if we have one of these objects in this category of towers of relative modules under C, so at every level we have a DN module, we have a comparison map from C to the, to the PN module, and we have a whole tower of such things. So this is what, how we specify such an object like that. And recall that TN here is a morphism, a functor, sorry, from D, from C to DN like this, right? And so we're gonna say that this is a pre-calculus if every TN like this admits a left adjoint. Now there could be more, uh, less strict conditions that we might be interested in, but this is one at the end of which this works. Okay. And it turns out that under some one, little bit technical conditions, if for example, every simplicial object is really cofibrin, this will work for example, um, M is simplicial sets, but not only, simplicial abelian groups works as well. And we have one of these objects here that is a pre-calculus then this thing is indeed a calculus, where here we're restricting to functors that take vibrant values. Again, if we work this in an infinity category context, we could probably avoid some of these technical conditions, but this is the basic idea that as long as we have one of these towers here that satisfies this additional pre-calculus condition, then this thing is indeed a calculus. And it's even a homotopy calculus, so it's gonna send a homotopy functor to a tower of homotopy functors under one additional condition, which just says basically if I apply this comparison functor Tn and then I act by any element of Pn and then I go back with the left adjoint, then this composite preserves weak equivalences. So we have some examples in which we know this holds. And so we have some examples and we know we actually get a homotopy calculus. 
We also have under stability conditions and the existence of a nice fibrant replacement that the layers in this tower are indeed and homogeneous as one would want them to be. So where do we want to go from here? Well, it could be fun to, as I said, consider the perspective where instead of looking with PN modules that are equipped with union as a strict monoidal structure, you could look at them equipped with intersection as a strict monoidal structure and get telescopes of comonads rather than telescopes of monads, sorry, rather than towers of comonads. You have a sort of dual theory. And one cool thing is you can sort of patch together on the one hand, the tower you could get for the comonads and the telescope for the monads and sort of have a, uh, a bivariant theory that one might be able to sort of play off the sort of the monads against the comonads using some sort of distributive laws or something. Of course, as I've mentioned several times, I think here, this is begging for an infinity categorical version to be done. Um, originally, uh, Brendan, I really, really hoped we'd be able to fit the Goodwilly calculus into this context, but we realized that the strict conditions we need on the commonads are just not going to hold in the Goodwilly calculus situation. They hold up to weak equivalence, but not on the nose. And so it's just not possible to apply this machinery as is so that the Goodwilly calculus would be an example. But I'm sure that if you wrote, if you wrote up an infinity cortical version, you could actually fit the uh, Goodwilly calculus into this context. And we're still in the process of developing examples and I think there are probably there's probably a fair number of interesting things one can do because there, there's so much you can do with like PN module structures you since it, it's defined in terms of having these families of commuting localizations and things like this I think there are probably some really interesting things one can do as various examples that are quite different from what has been done for so far in calculus so thank you very much for your attention it's been a great pleasure Thank you, Catherine, for this great talk. Okay. So, questions? May I ask a question? Sure. Well, in fact, um, I, I will ask a question and give the answer because okay, okay. in the in the meantime, I was thinking about it because the 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 bar construction that you described and, and Bruno said, hey, well, why is this bar and not cobar? Well, actually, we have been using the same construction for algebras over monads. And it was also simplicial. I was saying, how is it possible? Because if it's a monad, it should be co-simplicial, but it was also simplicial. Well, that, now the answer is the following. Uh, uh, we are interested in doing this for monads, but the first thing that we do is look at the Eilenberg moore adjunction and then reverse the arrows and build maze bar construction with the forgetful functor and the free functor reversed. So it's exactly the same construction that you did. So actually we were uh, uh, const making a bar construction for a commonad without knowing it. Huh? Um, yeah, but then, but then uh, <laughs> uh, it makes other questions interesting uh, because uh, we, we, we found conditions on a monad so that that construction was useful to us. And it meant, for example, that the monad would commute with geometric realization or it would commute with sifted colimits, things like that, which were automatic in the case of a, 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 a monad associated to an operat. Mm -hmm. So my, my question, and this is a question for which I don't know the answer, can you uh, translate the, your compliant condition in terms of the dual monad for the same commonad? I would think so, yes. I would have to think about it, but I think one should be able to, yes. Yeah. Um, let's see if I can... So uh, my guess is that it might uh, be the case for monads associated to, to operats because this is the framework in which our things uh, work nicely. Mm -hmm. eh? Oh, that'd be great. Guess. Yeah, no, I, that'd be a really cool thing about, yes. Thank you for the question. More questions? Yeah. One, if I may, during your talk, you only mentioned examples with chain complexes, and but I imagine that you already have examples dealing with topological spaces or simplicial sets or stuff like this, no? So, I mean, the for with example for simplicial being groups, for example, right? So that was where I had the the family of primes with which I, with respect mm -hmm. to which I was successfully successfully localizing. So the, I was trying to come up with a good example that did something interesting for simplicial sets and ended up having to think about simplicial abelian groups instead because all the examples I came up with were ones where 
um, basically everything was a co-algebra for the co-monads in question that I was thinking about. And therefore, all of the uh, gamma k's were in fact trivial. <laughs> so it wasn't all that interesting. So I think that um, one can certainly come up with uh, examples, but um, finding, finding examples of, of co-monads, I mean, I was trying to do something that was different from what had been done before. And uh, just trying to come up with something that was just, let me take some of my favorite co-monads and see what I can do with them. I think about some of my favorite adjunctions, look at the associated comonads and see what I can build from that. And what I found is that either the arrows are going the wrong ways for comparing the comonads or, um, or the, everything was a, turned out to admit a co-algebra structure and therefore the, this, these gamma K constructions were not very interesting. So, so sorry, Catherine, aren't Posnikov towers canonical examples? I would think so, yes. Yeah, I mean, because Bally was sort of the chain complex version of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Catherine, you had this notion of a module over the category PN. Mm -hmm. I was wondering whether the category of finite pointed sets, this is a module, right? If you just take the pointed sum of things of, of as many copies as are in your subset, mm -hmm. whether this isn't sort of universal in some sense and that I mean, having this as a diagram category, you could do gamma simplicial sets and, and things like this, which might be good to, to look for mm -hmm. samples. That's a good idea. That's a very good idea. Oscar? So one of the features that the flavors of calculus that I know about, which are only two, it's only orthogonal calculus and, and Goodwillie calculus, but one of the features that they have is that the homogeneous functors turn out to have more structure than you have a right to expect, namely their yes. infinite spaces. Is there, does that fit into your picture somehow? Not in the most general context, I don't think so. So, I mean, I've been going back, I've been looking more deeply at the papers in which people look uh, at the structure and the derivatives that one gets from the, uh, in the different uh, homogeneous layers and so on. And you really need, you need more information. I mean, you need to be in a very specific context often to, to be able to derive more from that. Or it could be that I just haven't seen how to do it. But I think it, one probably needs more knowledge of the category M in particular, I think. But um, I think it's a good question. Like when, when can you, when will you have that extra structure? And I haven't gotten that far yet. Thanks. But yeah, that's a good point. And that's something that, that we really would like to do at some point or would like somebody to do, <laughs> that'd be great. Any more questions? Oh, not a question, but a typo. If you're ever going to reuse your slides. I'm sorry, what did you say, Andy? It's not a question, but a typo, just in case you ever re reuse your slides. Yes, where's my typo? I'm sure there was one. Um, in the in the action law, you forgot one of the applications of theta. Okay, thank you. Yes. <laughs> you know, you, you know how it is. You can go through your slides. Uh, a thousand times and there'll always be typos. But yeah, thank you. <laughs> Any more typos, questions? <laughs> <laughs> so with any luck, no, it, was, it will take more than luck. Um, I hope that we'll have a, a draft of this on the on the archive this summer. I mean, it's very close, but um, well, you guys all know what happened with COVID in the last year. So then it's been tough. Also, since I made a crazy decision to become associate VP in PFL, which means I don't have even having less time for uh, <laughs> for doing that. So. so we feel really honored that you managed to make this talk here. <laughs> thank you, oh, Catherine. I know how it is. Yeah. So yeah. So thank you again. Thank uh, you. Thanks for the great talk. Thank you.